Welcome to the Market Insight Call, where we sift through the noise to get to the signal to give you actionable advice so you can make informed decisions. Joining me this week, like every week, is Chris Ahrens. Why don't you uh, tell us what's going on in the market? Yeah, well, no outline this week. We're going to hop right into it and look at the S&P 500. There's a, a lot of rough headlines, and of course it is September, so it is what you get um, with the stock market. So this is just the S&P 500 chart. I wanted to put in context, um, we pulled this out a couple months ago too, just the cycle we've had since, since October, because it has been a large run up. And we did run into some resistance, which came in an earnings season that was largely expected, right? We, we, we stalled out. We didn't really have that fundamental case to keep moving higher from earnings. When we look back to what's happened, we saw moves, when I'm just looking at the, the green bars, 14%, about 11%, and another 11%. And the pullbacks in the red throughout this period have been 7 to 8%, most recently only about 5%. Mm -hmm. So if we're looking at potential moves based on the cycle, you know, 7 8% pullback puts the market right at 4,200, which is where there's some support when we zone back out of, on the chart a little bit. So throughout the cycle, 4,200 seems to be where we would come if, if this continues to keep selling down a little bit. What would we expect, like just on averages, for a, a drawdown? So the average drawdowns, we can pull that out here, is actually going back to the 80s. And we pulled gray bars. So the gray bars up top are the calendar year returns. So if you're not checking accounts very often, that's what you feel. You're going to just feel mm -hmm. the, the full calendar. But if you're high watermark in your portfolio, checking it daily, you're going to feel every entry year decline, which is what the red is at the bottom. Now, using the whole data series, you're going to get an average 14.3% intra-year decline. That of course includes all the outliers of the, the long drawdown. So you probably should use a median drawdown, which would be somewhere around 11%, which is the median pullback throughout the 80s. And average, which I put in a, the red box there, is somewhere around that median as well. So about 10 to 11% has been the average intra-year declines. And just wanted to highlight, we pulled it last month as well when we were in August. We are in September. It's the only month of the year that has, since 1928, had more down months than up months, with uh, about 42 up months and 52 down months through September. So don't want to spend too much time on seasonality, but it is a, it is a headwind for the market. Right. And you know we did have reasons to sell too. We, we were part of that selling pressure. We refilled hub accounts for those and distribution that have a time horizon that's shorter than the rest of the portfolios. You know, we, we do have long time horizon portfolios where we're not going to make a change based on September. But for those that need cash, we did. We did pull off some cash so that we could meet distributions. So, so we're aware of the technicalities that, that September tends to be uh, to sell off and all the academic people say don't pay attention to it, but the market does. Uh, and, and people sell off. And then going into that type of atmosphere, seeing that we were above trend line. Uh, it, it made a lot of sense to just go ahead and take some chips off the table. But as you said, that doesn't mean that every uh, um, every month of September right before we're, we're raising cash by right. any means. And we are running up to a couple other headwinds. We're going we're gonna to see we, we have some issues with, with labor and strikes, which can affect margins. Energy prices have been moving up you know, really high. And of course, we have politics, which snuck up on us pretty quickly which will hit. But just to start with, uh, with energy prices, this is just a simple chart of the futures prices on, on WTI crude futures. And we can see over $90 a barrel, which is at a, almost a 12 month high. And that can lead to inflation expectations moving higher. Now we already can see that in the bottom right with the most recent inflation numbers we had going May, June, and July. We were in that 0 0.1, 0 0.2 annualizing near that 2% Fed target, and then we had this blowout in August, which was 0.6. A lot was from the energy move higher. Yeah. But the market expected that, and it's, it's pretty easy to see energy prices at, at the tank and be prepared for where, at least on the lagging data that comes out on inflation, to know you're going to see some hot numbers. And, and the Fed does, they try to extract this with the different types of CPI, so they're trying to, to mute this. But a lot of people, I think, rightly call uh, an increase in energy prices a, a consumer tax uh, because it's really embedded in everything. Whether uh, you're at the pump or not, doesn't matter. All of your goods that you're getting have to be shipped. 
Uh, so it's such an integral part to the economy that we see these prices show up throughout the entire index, not just on energy prices. Right, because just the energy alone is only 7% of the index, but like you said, it's going to flow. It's going to flow through to the input cost of food pretty, pretty directly, too. Right. And we can look at what you just said, which is that uh, acting as a tax. So the, the red line of this chart is gasoline as a share of disposable income. And we pulled this chart back out about over a year ago when the last time energy prices were spiking and really showed that at least historically because the chart goes back to the 60s we are at a, a low part for the expenditures of gasoline obviously taxes go up it's not not a good thing right so you're still going to be a negative for the economy when the, when this does rise but at least historically speaking it's not something that's off the charts right and it does tend to to move up higher before recession and during recession as shown by the chart. The one that's actually probably more troubling to the consumer is actually the interest rates, which is the black line, interest payments, which is approaching historical highs. And, and being that energy has that relation with, with inflation and inflation with the Fed is related to interest rates, it's not surprising to see uh, these things at least move together. You could say that energy causes a recession because inflation goes up and the Fed raises interest rates, which causes a recession. Uh, and, and we really haven't seen that uh, effect yet. Uh, we have interest rates being raised while oil prices were kind of low. Uh, or. or at least certainly coming off of those uh, those price to a much higher point. Uh, so it's it's something that you just want to put an asterisk on and, and watch for sure. Yeah, and potentially it, it potentially could be an opportunity. This is a chart of XLE, the sector ETF for energy. So the producers, refiners, uh, also is gonna have a couple pipelines in there too. Up towards, um, not all time highs, because the chart does go back, I think in 2017, several years ago too. Um, but near recent highs, at least, on price, if we look at it with total return, because they pay high dividends, it is actually on a 12-month high um, for return. So potentially there's an opportunity here. We have been adding to energy over the last month throughout portfolios. It's a small sector, 4 to 5% of the S&P 500, so it's not something we're allocating significantly to, but at least on a, on a small level, we have been adding. Right, if we had 4% in the index, we're only gonna add about five, or mm -hmm. about 8% total in the portfolio, so it's not something like technology where it's a significant overweight potential. Now, you're a better technician than I am. Whenever I'm looking at that chart, I kind of see a pennant and the ability to really jump in price, like you were saying. You're a better technician, though, so what do you see? Mm -hmm. The, you know, the, the actual breakouts on a pennant, the, when you, you're testing them, they're going to be close to 50-50. What I'd like to look more at would be what intermarket analysis is generally called, which is when you're starting to take a ratio chart and looking at the effects of the rest of the market based on the sector too. So that's what I have here. So in the green line, that's just the S&P 500. Same chart we showed at the beginning, looks a little bit different. The black line is a relative ratio of XLE, so the energy sector, and the S&P 500. You can see they're starting to kind of move at different times. So when, when that black line's going up, energy's outperforming relative. They could, they could both be going down, right. but energy's going down less or going up more. And that's what we've been seeing. At least that's held the last two years. It may not hold a much longer than that historically, but at least we've seen, so there has been some diversification benefits. Now we do know that energy can be very cyclical, so it can, obviously, if there's a significant slowdown, so it's something we're, we monitor very very closely. It's on our signal part of our strategy where we, we look at it very technically and tactically there. If we get a sell signal, we're, we'll be selling energy. Right. Yeah. right. So, but it does look like a, a pretty good opportunity, at least in the short term here. Right, but you, as you mentioned, we, we want to watch because there are times when they become very correlated on the downside. Uh, so uh, we, we are sitting with our finger on the, uh, the trade button mm -hmm. uh, if we need to. Yeah, that re really yeah. transitions us to politics. Right. So not, talking, not my favorite we're part. We're talking about tax cut or <laughs> taxes from energy. Let's, let's get into the real uh, government because we're getting a lot of headlines there. A lot of headlines. They came up pretty fast. Um, this government shutdown odds, I'm not going to put a, a probability on it. I don't know if you are. Um, well, I know that it'll <laughs> reopen. Okay. <laughs> so you have your odds there. We can look back at um, reaction to the market, and it's been mixed since inception. This goes all the way back to the 70s. I bracketed it off in red to see the average S&P 500 move um, one week before, because you want to see the reaction. We know it's coming, and 
we're a little bit more than a week out from when the shutdown would happen. Mm -hmm. So looking at it one, I, I would prefer two weeks, but I didn't put the chart together. Um, on average, down 11 basis points. So this isn't something you should trade? <laughs> no, nothing to trade on average. And then when we look at the change during the shutdown towards the right, up one basis point. So nothing that's significant at all in terms of, of trading. If you look at the since 1995, where you're going to have an outlier, that'll be December 2018, now you can start to see that there was a pullback heading into the shutdown and a recovery through the shutdown. But whenever you're looking at historical data, you always have the problems with, are you just pulling the government shutdown or did you get something else? Because in 2018, the Fed was in a tightening cycle. Coming out of 2008, they had rates low for, I guess, eight years. So there's a big something else yeah. there. So there's, and I actually pulled that. I wanted to look back at those periods to see kind of what it would look like um, two weeks before and then two weeks after these, the most recent shutdowns, so since the, the 95. And there was a shutdown at the beginning of 2018 for a day. There was nothing to see there in the, the one day period. But at the end of 2018, was largely thought that the Fed had raised rates too much. It was only a, around 2%, but they had started in 2016 and had coming off of zero for, for a long time. So there was a 10% pullback heading in above those two weeks before. And then that's that middle of the, part of the chart where you see the low at 10.71. Then a strong recovery where using the framework of two weeks before and two weeks after, stocks actually finished up. So if we, if we look at that 2018, it was clearly an outlier. Uh, and then we look at uh, the reasons. So if, it, if it's an outlier, that's probably not the government shutdown that's driving the market. Uh, and, and we can see a really good explanation, a better explanation than just the shutdown. So I would say don't try to, tr uh, to uh, sell this beforehand. Uh, and then maybe if you want to make a trade it's after the fact, that's whenever you actually would add some risk to your portfolio because now that uncertainty is going to come out and, and you don't have that headline mm -hmm. uh, worry over your head. And just I pulled two more, go through it pretty quickly. 2013, same thing. We did see similar style chart, 2% though. So again, you're is it, could it have been something else that happened in 2013 to bring the market down 2%? And then the same thing happened where the market rallied while the government was shut down. And then again, final one I have here is in 95 and 96. There was a couple shutdowns throughout that period, 21 days in total. The first part of the shutdown, you can't even see on the chart because the market was moving up. The second part is in the, the center right of the chart where there was another 2% pullback. So at least for these examples, it has been two and then a, and then a recovery. Absolutely. So on this next slide, what we're looking at is labor costs. And really to, to kind of set some background uh, there, we've talked about the onshoring that we expected after COVID and, and all of the risk within the supply chains, really wanting to bring that back onshore, uh, as well as the AI revolution. I think this is really driving a lot of this labor costs. Uh, because there is onshoring, there's more demand for, for jobs, unemployment is very low. Um, and uh, the unions, who really haven't had a, a, a sizable raise uh, in quite some time, are beginning to demand it. We saw this at UPS, where I think they're going to make $175,000 uh, uh, to drive a UPS truck. I don't think they're going to have a problem recruiting people. <laughs> uh, it's going to be really hard to get there. But we also see it within uh, the, the Screen Actors Guild. And then the, the, bigger, the biggest threat right now is probably the United Auto Workers. I know we have a lot of local factories that are suppliers to that that are really concerned about this. And they're asking for a 40% increase. Uh, once again, I think what is behind the story is that there is onshoring, there's a lot of demand for employment, uh, and, and then there's also the AI uh, that's coming in uh, that's taking place. So one thing is in California, uh, they are actually outlawing the use of AI for trucks. It's going to be a boom uh, and a benefit for truck drivers if they are not competing against AI. But then the Screen Actors Guild, a lot of that is they don't want AI being used to make content. Uh, I don't know how they're going to win that fight long term uh, because you can now do it at a much lower cost. Uh, but that's probably what's driving these labor costs, but it's certainly going to show up in companies, uh, mm -hmm. especially in the profit market. And, and, and our, our exposure to these specific sectors is, is very low. I mean, we haven't bought an auto producer probably in, in dividend strategies maybe a long time ago. but it's going to have effects that reach the rest of the market, right? Yeah. When, the, when the UAW came out and was 
um, an announcing their strike, the market did pull back a little bit because, like you said, there's going to be margins and the expectation that that could creep yeah, into other sectors. I think the larger sectors. theme is still back to inflation, right? Because right. if we have that onshoring, there's demand for labor, the labor prices are going to go up, but there's also demand for resources. You can look at that yellow truck as one of the uh, uh, companies that have now gone under, they're selling their assets. That was the discount provider for uh, shipping, well, you still need that shipping. So now the costs for shipping are going to go up because a low cost provider is now out of the market. Uh, and I don't think the truck drivers are too concerned because now they can get hired. And UPS is paying 175000 What do you think their wages are going to be at, at the new? So I think a lot of the theme that we want to think about is how does this affect inflation and the broader market, not so much any company specific right. uh, income statement. But it could affect margins, right? And when we look at the index, the index is going to be 10 10 to 12 percent profit margin. And what we've actually been looking at for these, where the strikes are happening in very low margin sectors or subsectors. When I polled here, is the automobile manufacturers in green, their margins are up close to 7 percent, which is a little bit higher than the historical, which has been below 5 percent. But it's not like their margins are anywhere close to the the index, which is which is higher to that. And I know Ford came out and said the company would be a going concern if if they had to pay those wages because right. they just can't, they, they don't have the spread there. And then the same is similar in movies and entertainment where they haven't been very profitable in, in several years since before COVID. Now margins, again, under 5% for the blue line, which was movies and entertainment. Right? One of the things that we often see uh, uh, as an indicator for the market on whether it's frothy or not is IPOs. And we haven't seen a lot of companies IPO on for quite some time really since the last correction. Now, you want to talk a little bit about the IPO yeah, market? Yeah, and that makes a lot of sense. You don't want to be bringing in a, an initial public offering while the market's in a significant pullback, like 2022. And this chart will have lagged a little bit. It won't have grabbed the, the recent IPOs. But we can see, as you referenced, some of the froth through 20 and 21, where the value of IPOs coming out was significant. And then through 2022, it was almost non-existent, really just the companies that really needed needed money. And then coming up recently, we've had some, some larger ones. I know Kava, a restaurant chain, they IPO'd a couple months ago. Price was above the IPO price, at least. Now, it wasn't probably a, a above the price that was first trading, because you, sometimes you, they, they try to price them a little bit lower to get a pop. That's to why people want an IPO, right? right? Same thing happening with Arm, and, and then Instacart was the, was the new one um, this week, where prices were trading above IPO prices, but generally not as high as that, that first trade price. And being that there are not that many IPOs coming in, there's always money that wants to chase these things and there's not a lot of uh, supply because they're gonna withhold right. those shares. So it's typical to see these uh, right. get frothy. And the, the calendar doesn't look anything really concerning. If you had a bunch of IPOs ready to come, come due soon, you would see probably a sell-off as people prepare cash, like you nice. said. But if you don't have to prepare cash, it wouldn't be as much of a potential sell-off. But if you're positioning and you have a, a, a chip provider and you want to buy ARM, you may add some selling pressure to sell your chip provider and go buy ARM Holdings. So there's really no broad implication for the market from here, but I would also say that most times if you buy IPOs on the secondary early on, uh, because of that effect, oftentimes you're paying a higher price than you would a year from now. Oh, yeah, the, the, the forward returns after paying that price are, are very low. Right. And then just to look at an overall risk on, risk off indicator that, that we've created, it's, it's a common one where it's a, another ratio chart where risk on is credit risky bonds, copper, high beta stocks, and then um, the cyclical stocks. Well, on the bottom, you're gonna have gold, which is, so you capture that copper to gold ratio. Treasuries, so now you've captured that credit risk to treasury bonds, and then low volatility stocks. So now you've captured high beta to low vol stocks. And really so far, it's not, not really flashing any, anything. Of course, you're gonna see some of a pullback that's consistent with what we've been talking about, but nothing significantly on the risk off side. And then finally, just looking at our long-term chart, we're still at the, the high end of it. Right. So it's nothing, we haven't broken below our long-term trends, still in that upper area where we would say it was still a decent time to start raising a little cash, which we already did, so we don't have to, but if, if someone had to, it's not we, a bad time. If we can stay above this trend line uh, like we have, I would. We're, we're at 18 months. We'd like to be at 24 months at some point. That is often the target. Uh, we want to. We want to be disciplined in our process on how to do that. Uh, so long as we don't dip below that and we can stay above, 
we'll continue to fill those, uh, those cash buckets uh, each quarter because we know that a recession ultimately will happen. It's not an if, it's a when. Uh, now we hope it's a quite some time from now, uh, but if that's the case, we want to be positioned and prepared for 24 months cash. Absolutely. Well, we really appreciate you uh, going through this, Chris, and I hope you guys appreciated it. If you liked Chris's jacket, it's purple, and want to see him get a little bit more flashy, hit that like button while you're down there. Make sure you subscribe so you always get uh, our take on the market. And make sure you hit that share button and send it with friends that would also be able to take that and, and be able to watch uh, Chris's flashiness with his coat. Uh, we really appreciate you joining us, and we look forward to next month. Thank you.